Welcome, Ben Mama. A lot of people say that a console is only as good as its games. And while this might be true, looking back in retrospective, you could definitely argue that marketing played a much bigger factor at the time of the system's release. Indeed, when you look back at the history of video game consoles, it's pretty much always the console with the best and most expensive marketing budget that wins out. It's a proven technique. Shove something in people's faces enough times to make them believe they want it, and your work is done. Just let the cash roll in. This is why companies with the deepest pockets survived, and all the others fell by the wayside. That's not to say that these companies were always completely honest when it came to this marketing. Console manufacturers were always trying to find a way to gain an edge over their rivals, and if this meant telling a few porkies, then so be it. As long as they weren't so outrageous that they would damage their brand, it was all good. And in this video we're going to be looking at a bit of both. Claims that seemed to be pretty genuine on the face of things, but were clearly bollocks to anyone who did their research. And those statements that left people laughing in the aisles, almost insulted by how stupid and gullible these companies thought we were. All the big boys feature here, and at least one you wouldn't expect to. So I like to think that I've covered all bases in this video. So let's get on with the show, as I proudly present five completely crazy console claims. Some of you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits. 3DO was 32 bits. The Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Hmm? 16 and 32 are less than 64. So with 64 bits, 3D graphics, real world animation, and lightning speed that you can only get with Jaguar? Which is more advanced? Clifford! Can you repeat the question? Jaguar! 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 That's crazy! When talking about outrageous claims made by key figures at console companies, the first one that most people think of is the infamous interview with former Atari CEO Sam Trammell that appeared in both Edge and Next Gen magazine back in July 1995. The only way to describe it was a total car crash, and other key figures at Atari such as UK marketing manager Daryl Steele spent months trying to defend it, engaging in full damage limitation exercises. Now, by the time this interview appeared, it was already known that the Jaguar was struggling in the marketplace, and the situation was getting worse by the minute thanks to all the hype around the soon to be launched next generation 32-bit systems from Sega and Sony. Jaguar sales had almost stalled completely while people waited to see what the Saturn and PlayStation had to offer. Now what Atari and their management should have done is prepare for that by dropping prices and bigging up the advantages of their own hardware over what was coming. But what Atari Corporation's illustrious leader actually did was spout a load of complete bollocks that just made him look like an idiot and painted his company as one in panic that was getting ready to fail. Which wasn't far from the truth in all honesty but those reading the magazine weren't to know that. Amongst the many ludicrous claims made by Jack Tramiel's prodigal son were that the PlayStation and Saturn would retail for over $500, they didn't, that Sega had already agreed to release five games for the Jaguar as part of a famous lawsuit, this is actually true but none of these ever arrived, that the Sega Saturn is a pooch, its architecture was a mess and the Jaguar was more powerful, I think we all know it wasn't that Sony wasn't a video game company and didn't know how to market that kind of technology. They most certainly did, and even if we ignore what they did with the PlayStation, they already had had plenty of success with the MSX machines and making games for Sega consoles. That the Jaguar 2 would be released in 1996, yeah we know the answer to this one too, and you could argue that this interview actually helped kill it. And finally, the one that gets most repeated, he said that if Sony sold the PlayStation at $299, they would sue them for price dumping. They didn't. I think it's fair to say that you could write an entire book about the mistakes made by Atari Corporation throughout their existence. 
from Jack stalling on the 7800 while he argued about paying GCC what they were owed, to starving America of ST computers to supply the more lucrative European market, to cancelling the Panther and then rushing the Jaguar to market to try and make up for it, leaving it as a buggy mess. Sam Trammell's interview pretty much sums all this up really, a company that always talked a good game but rarely delivered on what was promised, which for an Atari fan like me is genuinely heartbreaking. That's crazy! From one 64-bit console to another, and now it's time to turn our attention to the very last mainstream home console to utilise cartridges as a storage medium, the Nintendo 64. Originally codenamed Project Reality, and then known as the Ultra 64, before the final name was settled upon just a few months before release, the N64 was based around the technology found in groundbreaking Silicon Graphics supercomputers that were used to create the special effects for big budget Hollywood blockbusters like Terminator 2 and The Law Merman. To be honest, the Project Reality name was probably enough of a warning to the overinflated claims that would follow, and there were plenty of them too. Most notably for the mouth of the Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Nintendo of America, Peter Main, who was already claiming that Nintendo's new console would use reality immersion technology, whatever the hell that means. One of the most interesting things about the time leading up to the Nintendo 64's launch is that unlike any previous console debut, we all got to see and play the technology for ourselves prior to opening our wallets, or so Nintendo had us believe anyway. Through a deal with leading arcade game manufacturers Midway, the Silicon Graphics based Nintendo 64 technology would be used in several new coin ops, most notably Cruising USA and Killer Instinct. The reception to these was incredibly positive from both the press and consumers alike, only whetting the appetite for Nintendo's new console even further, and it wasn't long before Peter Main was boasting to the press that the Nintendo 64 will offer pixel perfect conversions of the existing SGI arcade games. His boasts would just become even more grandiose as time went on, with perhaps the biggest fib of them all coming in the claim that the Nintendo 64 will offer a quantum leap, not just in technology, but also the quality of its games. Peter Main continued to make bold statements about the Nintendo 64 right up until the console finally went on sale. And amongst his other mistruths were that the Nintendo 64 will offer a CD add-on within the first year of its release, and that it would also have the capability to go online and offer a vast array of new possibilities, including online gaming, without the restrictions of previous consoles. Despite these flagrant mistruths, Peter would continue in his role with Nintendo right up until 2002, when he announced his retirement from the video game industry. That's crazy! When we consider the biggest failures in the history of the home console industry, the Amstrad GX4000 will always be ranked somewhere near the top. One of the very few consoles to be both designed and manufactured by a British company, the GX4000 was launched in Western Europe only in 1990 to a fair bit of fanfare, and was based around Amstrad's popular range of CPC computers, which had just been upgraded themselves in the form of the CPC Plus range, which was technologically identical to the GX4000 and could play the same games. Of course, Amstrad was owned and run by one Alan Sugar, now Lord Sugar no less, and more famous for his leading role in The Apprentice than making cheap electronics, which was very much his mission back in the 1980s as his company began to secure a huge foothold in the UK market. He had seen the success of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum computer in his homeland and decided he wanted a piece of the action. The Amstrad CPC range was the result of that. Of course, he would later go on to buy the Sinclair computer business too, giving him an even bigger slice of the pie. But by the late 80s, the popularity of 8-bit computers was waning thanks to the arrival of new 16-bit offerings from Atari and Commodore, as well as several more advanced home consoles such as the Sega Mars System and Nintendo NES. Not one to be left out, Mr Sugar knew that he had to keep up with the times and tasked his engineers to come up with a two-pronged replacement. And they duly delivered with the aforementioned CPC plus range of computers as well as the GX4000 console that replaced their existing 8-bit range. 
These boasted advanced new features, but retained backwards compatibility to make them more enticing to existing Amstrad owners. Now a lot of the system specs for this range actually sounded pretty good for the time, especially when compared to its rivals. They had 4096 colours available to choose from, 64k or 128k of RAM, 3 channel stereo sound and 16 sprites per scanline, but at the moment its designer Cliff Lawson stated that the GX4000 was at least as good as the Super Nintendo, it was impossible to take any of Amstrad's other claims seriously. Despite being backed by a pretty hefty marketing budget, the GX4000 disappeared without trace in less than a year. The competition for the console was just too strong, with the 16-bit Sega Mega Drive arriving in Western Europe the very same year, as well as funky new handhelds like the Nintendo Game Boy and Atari Lynx, further eating into that portion of the market. Amstrad were left with nowhere to go and decided to completely withdraw from the video game industry, instead focusing on their own range of more business focused PC compatibles. That's crazy! Ah, Sega's last console, the wonderful Dreamcast, the system everyone desperately wanted to succeed, especially after the lackluster sales of the Saturn and return Sega to their rightful position as industry leaders. But sadly it didn't turn out like that, because selfish idiots stopped buying games, and just pirated them instead, before getting tempted away by the promise of a cheapo DVD player. The console has since gathered a cult following amongst retro gamers, and still sees a host of commercial quality games being released for it right up until this very day proving time after time that the Dreamcast was more powerful than perhaps some people gave it credit for, and making us even sadder that it was Sega's last hurrah. Now it's easy to go back and blame the Sony hype train for ruining the Dreamcast's chances of success, and bear with me because I'll be coming back to that in a bit more detail. But Sony weren't the only ones telling fibs about their respective consoles technical prowess, as the following statements from Sega's very own marketing department prove. All the following claims were printed in the video game press of the time, and it will be interesting to see if you can spot a regular theme amongst them. During the 20th 1999, the much anticipated 128-bit Sega Dreamcast video game system features an advanced 128-bit graphics engine. July the 6th 1999, the Sega Dreamcast features many hardware firsts, such as its advanced built-in 56K modem and 128-bit architecture. June the 2nd, 1999, Sega Dreamcast will achieve several industry firsts at launch. Its advanced 128-bit architecture makes it the first console with evolutionary capabilities, allowing it to grow and change to match advances in technology and the needs and desires of the consumer. August the 19th, 1999, Introducing the Sega Dreamcast, the 128-bit Super Console with a built-in 56K modem. Yes, you got it. Sega repeatedly claimed that the Dreamcast was an 128-bit console, when in truth it was actually 32-bit, just like the Saturn before it and its Sony rivals too. That's not to say they lied completely though, as the Dreamcast did boast a 128-bit graphics-oriented floating-point unit delivering 1.4 G-flops, but nobody actually knows what that means. That's crazy! Okay, okay, all you Sega fanboys can calm down now. I did say I'd be coming back to the PlayStation 2, and I'd definitely save the best until last, because Sony really had no shame when it came to fibbing about the prowess of their consoles. What is rather unique about this entry, however, is that it's the only console where the wild claims made by its manufacturer had absolutely no influence on the system's success. Because with sales of over 155 million units, the PS2 remains the best selling console of all time, and wasn't officially discontinued until 2014. But whilst the undoubted success of the second PlayStation console is certainly well known, so are the many mistruths of one Ken Kutaragi who almost single-handedly drove the PS2 hype train head-on through every single station, taking out everything in his path. The man known to many inside Sony as Crazy Ken certainly lived up to his moniker on more than one occasion, with some of the most fantastical and downright bizarre claims you'll ever hear. 
Let's start with the time he responded to a journalist who said Sega's Dreamcast had already launched the next generation, when he quipped that, the next generation starts when we say so. A pretty mild one, I'm sure you'll agree, but they only build from here. For instance, there was the time he explained the capabilities of the PS2 like the plot of a Hollywood movie. With the PS2, you can communicate to a new cyber city. This will be the ideal home server. Did you see the movie The Matrix? Same interface, same concept. Starting from next year, you can jack into The Matrix too. I suppose this one kind of makes sense when you learn that the best-selling launch title for the PS2 was in fact The Matrix on DVD. Crazy Ken had already claimed the PS2 made both standalone DVD players and other home consoles irrelevant, but he soon turned his attentions to the good old PC compatible too. A new world will be created on the basis of PlayStation 2. The client right now is the PC, but the PlayStation 2 will be a completely different environment. But best of all, there was the rather conveniently leaked claims that the PS2 was so powerful when compared to a PC that it could be used by Rock to launch weapons of mass destruction. It was actually reported by some of the press of the era that Iraq had imported 4,000 PS2s for this purpose. It's certainly never been confirmed, but it's more than likely that Ken himself started off such rumours. It certainly sounds like something he would say. One of the quotes that definitely didn't come from inside Sony, and definitely wasn't leaked accidentally to the press, told us that PlayStation 2 consoles can be used to calculate ballistic data for long range missiles, or in the design of nuclear weapons. You do have to wonder if Iraq was sending back opium in exchange for these consoles, because Ken and his cronies were certainly high on something. These kinds of claims kept coming through the PS2's life too, and when the threat of new and more advanced Xbox console started to loom on the horizon, Ken was quoted as saying, Beating us for a short moment is like accidentally winning a point from a karate master, and Microsoft is still not a black belt. Just like with their operating systems, they might come out with something good around the third generation of their release. Ouch. His insane rantings didn't end with the PS2 either, as once its successor, the predictably named PlayStation 3, was around the corner, he came out with these gems. The PS3 is not a games machine. We've never once called it a games machine. With the PS3, our intentions have been to create a machine with supercomputer calculation capabilities for home entertainment. This time Microsoft has stated clearly that it's going after PlayStation. However, they're not going after the PlayStation 3, but the PlayStation 2. They were looking at 2, and that's why Xbox 360 became like that. If processors of high performance and wide bandwidth like the cell were linked together without sufficient security, a worldwide system crash would occur with just one attack. It's nice to know that Ken never changed, and he continues to be one of the few genuinely entertaining personalities left in the now very stale and corporate video game industry, and I'm sure that he'll be popping his head out of his padded cell once again when the PS6 arrives on the scene. PlayStation 2, now $499.95. And that runs up my look at five completely crazy console claims. Which of these crazy claims was your favourite, or do you have another memorable quote that I didn't include in this video? We always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal followers for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for the much appreciated pledges. Paul Daniel, Mins, Dos Gamer Man, Luke MC, Carl Olsen, Seth Robinson, Grady Haynes, Mark Strickland, Klimatorn, Trogdor the Burninator, Daniel Skoronsky, Ben P. Stein, Tabby Kitsune, Alan J. Dodds, Your Eyes Are Bleeding, David Maddox and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now, where you can get access to host content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and we'll see you all again for another video very soon.